There's two days of formal meetings tomorrow and Wednesday with civil society leaders. The government ministers are going to be on on Thursday. But in addition, there's there's side events, and this is the opening side event, and they call it side. We call it a side event on the margins of the ministerial, outside the State Department, but just pretty much within the vicinity of the State Department. And then there's five days worth of, of side events, and this is the kickoff. So this is the very first event of the week. So thank you for, for coming and helping us kick off ministerial. And again, Mr. Brownback, Ambassador Brownback has made it clear that this ministerial is really meant to, to start a global religious freedom movement. You know, and obviously civil society is going to play a big, big role in, in, in building that, that movement uh, and in being part of that global religious freedom movement. So that we can start to handle problems that you're going to hear about today. You know, stories of persecution in China. Religious persecution in China is the topic of our opening event here. You know, and there's, there's similar stories of persecution going on all over the world. And so again, the whole purpose of this ministerial and, and what, what's going to come out of it, you know, including coming out of this lunch, you know, by the end of this week we should have a, a roadmap on, on what, we, what we can do as civil society leaders and civil society representatives and religious communities to uh, build, what, what we want to do is build like a global network of multi-faith roundtables, religious freedom and or policy roundtables, where we can start to really confront these, these problems of persecution, really dig into what we can do in multi-faith fashion, the coordinated actions, and global, the global network is what we want to build. So what, we already have an international religious freedom roundtable here in Washington, D.C. They're, they're a co-sponsor of this, along with, with the Center for Studies on New Religions. We want some of the with, with that. We've got the, the International Observatory for Religious Liberty for Refugees, right, with, with uh, Lizzie in here. Uh, and the, the Uyghur Human Rights Project. You know, we're all co-sponsoring this, but the, the IRF Roundtable here in Washington is a model for establishing similar such multi-faith roundtables around the world, uh, and then coordinating with governments and trying to coordinate actions, whatever actions that like-minded governments that are working together to advance religious freedom around the world, we want to coordinate with those actions. So you have civil society and governments uh, working in coordination so that we can, again, start to address these problems that are associated with, with religious persecution. Start to, start to score victories and reduce the amount of persecution and eventually eliminate religious persecution in the world. And that's the, that's the end goal, goal. So, again, today is the, the kickoff. We're focusing on religious persecution in China. We're going to have expert remarks first from Moscow, Trevine, Rosita, sorry, 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 and then Alex and And Moscow is going to introduce them properly. And then after they're done, we're going to have stories for the religious community who were victims of persecution in China. We have Dr. Larry Liu from Falun Gong. We have Nuri Turkel from the Uyghur Human Rights Project. And Ms. Jen Queen from the Church of Almighty God. And we also have a, a couple of victims and, and members of those communities here in the audience today. And after they tell their stories, we're going to have a little bit of a discussion on solutions, looking ahead, like what can we do to start to address the, these problems. And Terry Marsh with Human Rights Law Foundation is here. She's got a little update on court victory that could be part of the solution. And then we'll open it up to the floor. Whatever time we have left, we'll open it up to QA. Does that sound good? Yes. All right, good. Now I'm going to start just by introducing Massimo, and he can introduce the rest of the expert panel. Then we can all introduce the, the, the speakers from the community. But Massimo Intervenia is a sociologist, sociologist of religion. But his studies focus on minority religions and new religious movements, the relationship between religion and society, the violence of religion, the religious fundamentalist movements, and Islamic fundamentalism. He has published numerous articles and books on these topics. He is founded, he is the current director of the Center for Studies on New Religions. He founded that in 1988. It's now the largest institution in the field of European studies on religious minorities, but he's an expert out. It's not just limited to Europe. In fact, he's been to China a few times, and he's been studying what's happening in China for, for a long time, so he's one of the experts who will kick it off. He's also the current deputy national coordinator of 
on the onset of Catholic well, Catholic Hawaiian, so let's say it like that. Almost. No, no longer? Okay, sorry about that. But anyway, I'm gonna turn it over to Massimo. You guys can speak from your from your analyses here, or speak here, whatever you can do. Thank you. A couple of months ago, we started a daily newspaper or magazine online about religion in China called Bitter Winter, which is currently published in eight languages, including Chinese and main edition is in English. Uh, one of the reasons I started this is really the <coughs> godfather of the initiative is the Chinese Communist Party. Because uh, in 2017, they organized two seminars, the first one in Zhengzhou and the second one in Hong Kong, uh, about the uh, uh, notion of CA Zhao, wrong translation is even cults, it's really a terrible teaching, and particularly one CA Zhao, the Church of Almighty God. And uh, they probably knew, I and the other Western colleagues, they invited very critical of the Chinese attitude. But there aren't so many experts around the world of Church of Almighty God and new religious movements in China, so they didn't really have an option. And what they shared with us, uh, they probably believe it was very good about their re-education uh, programs uh, and the repression of evil cults, but uh, actually persuaded us that uh, they were what they were doing was an uh, outrageous assault to religious liberty. So something needed to be done. So I and some colleagues uh, decided that uh, uh, apart from our academic publications, uh, uh, a popular magazine in several languages about religious liberty in China was needed. What we particularly were exposed to in uh, China were two things, and we were all experts uh, already, but we knew more. The first is our uh, re-education work. Now, in May this year, there has been a heated discussion at United Nations ECOSOC uh, because the United States and Germany criticized China for the re-education camps. And the Chinese diplomats say, we have abolished re-education camps. What are you talking about? And so uh, what is important is there are three different kinds of re-education camps in China. Uh, the Lao guy is re-education through labor, you are sentenced by a court of law. Uh, the Lao Zhao, uh, it's a police administrative measure, and that was really abolished in uh, 2013. Uh, but uh, uh, they were replaced by something actually much worse called uh, re-education through education camps. And uh, notwithstanding the, the, the nice name, in the camps of re-education through education, not only are you subject to intense psychological pressure, but you have to work for free, <coughs> and uh, people who, who express the slightest dissent are tortured, sometimes killed. So uh, it's not Disneyland, uh, not, and it's not a school, even if sometimes they are nicknamed a uh, school. So actually, these camps, even the propaganda videos they showed to us were a clear indication uh, it's a gross abuse of, uh, of human rights. And number two, we discussed the notion of Xie Jiao. It's a very old notion. The Ming started talking about Xie Jiao or heterodox teachings. And uh, we didn't deal with Falun Gong. The, the, the conference were focused on the older CAGR, the particular Church of Almighty God. And we were very happy to have the leader of Office 610, that's the anti CAGR office of the police, and to have access to the police documents, which proved that the many crimes the Church of Almighty God that was the focus of this is accused of actually were either uh, imaginary 
or like in the case of the McDonald's homicide in Sao Juan in 2014, committed by another religious group. The similar name, okay, similar name, but it's not the same. So uh, I don't believe I will be invited to personally a third time to China, but at least uh, uh, we got very useful uh, documents uh, uh, about the repression of the CGL, which is purely political, under the banner of uh, the crimes, uh, uh, the movements uh, uh, accused of uh, have never committed. So we started this magazine, which has different focuses. Uh, uh, recently, one is the situation of Uyghurs and uh, Kazakh and other Muslim minorities. I have interacted in international conferences with several scholars, more specialized than me in uh, uh, Xinjiang matters, uh, and uh, the current estimate accepted by most scholars, but we have Uyghur friends today who can confirm this is in the re-education through education camps, there are roughly one million uh, Muslims in China today, which is an enormous number. Because the Lao Gai Lao Jiao system at its peak has 180,000. So we have not seen such as huge efforts at uh, re education since the Cultural Revolution, and that's only the Uyghurs. Then uh, there is Church of Almighty God, then there are underground Catholics, which, despite the dealings with the Vatican, are still arrested. Uh, house church people, sometimes they are accused of being members of CGL, even if they are not. So uh, the, the concentrationary system is unprecedented. It's <coughs> reminiscent of the Gulag in Soviet Union, maybe 1.2, 1.5 million people, and people die there. People are tortured there. They are not schools. So I believe uh, we will hear about some specific cases uh, in this conference, but it's very important uh, uh, to focus on the fact that I'm from Italy, so I know China has the record number of Prada boutiques, uh, but beyond the Prada boutiques, uh, there are 1.2 to 1.5 million detained in inhuman, appalling conditions in concentration camps in China, and that only because of their religious faith. And uh, my last comment before introducing the other panelists, if we should stand united, because sometimes the Chinese propaganda through fake news try to divide people, saying the Uyghurs, they are terrorists, sympathies, they are sympathized for Al-Qaeda or <coughs> ISIS. So Church of Almighty God, they committed. Uh, Could you speak in the microphone? Uh, Church of Almighty God, they committed crimes. They didn't. Uh, Falun Gong are people who want to do ritual mass suicide. Uh, they don't. So we should not fall for the fake news, uh, and we should really present a united front because we are not talking about theology. We may disagree with each other's theology, I'm a Roman Catholic, uh, some people may have other ideas, but uh, what we should fight for is the basic elementary human rights as they are denied today in China. Thank you. Father continues with uh, Rosita Chorite, 25 years of experience as a diplomat, uh, a distinguished career. She has been the chairperson uh, during the Lithuanian presidency of the European Union of the Working Group on Humanitarian Aid, but uh, she is uh, now working for NGOs and is the president of the International Observatory of religious liberty of refugees, so she will speak about the refugee situation, people escaping from China. Yes, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to, to speak here today. And thank you for the grateful, fantastic organization. 
As you heard, I worked over 25 years as a diplomat, so I know perfectly well. And my last assignment was at the United Nations, and Lithuania at that time was even the non-permanent member of Security Council. So I know how the states work. So, and uh, why I switched from the governmental side to the NGO side is because as a human being, for me, it was very difficult to sit and do nothing when they, when they see that things are really very bad. So and that's that's we see every day to the, to the media, I believe. And, um, and the question is that, and I believe during those few days, it will be a lot of talk about it, that democracy is directly linked to the human rights. If there is no democracy, there is no respect for human rights. Of course, there is no liberty for the for the for the for, for religious beliefs, because those things they are totally interlinked, and you cannot divide and chop and say. When we have authoritarian regime, and we have more and more than around the world, so we cannot expect that these countries, when they control the, the they control the power, they control the, the elections, they control the freedom of speech they control also the people and the religions. If you belong to a group which is not exactly what the, the, the power, the, the party <coughs> or people in the power they like, naturally, these people, they will be persecuted. So, and, um, but the, the, the aspect that is uh, my everyday work is that people get out of their countries because they, they are persecuted and very often they are even tortured so they leave their country so what we do because it's 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 nice to say perhaps to go to the meetings and to stay to china or they to stay to russia or stay to burma that is you should respect your international obligations <coughs> that human rights matters and they, just, and they say, we either don't care, or we create a narrative, as, as Massimo Intervenia was mentioned, that every single people from those groups is somehow bad, and they don't need the proofs. They say, you know, they're bad. So that people, one day, they flee the country. And uh, lately, I'm working very close with the, with the uh, with the Church of Almighty God, which is quite a, a, a large group uh, in China. But for some reason, the Communist Party doesn't like them. So when they don't like them, they chase them. So people, they cannot uh, uh, openly believe in, in their church. And, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm watching on the watch to see the time that they will not be <laughs> So, and uh, the church cannot openly, openly go to church, they cannot openly read the, the, document, the, the books and etc. And uh, once the, the, the authorities, they discover that people, they are in this church, they put them in jail. And uh, very often people are uh, tortured. So, but the problem is, and that's, that's where my accent in my speech is, is what we do when these people, they reach our countries. Because now to talk about the refugees is so, is so unpopular because we have so many of them. Because it's all the time the, the, the line between who is refugee and who is migrant is all, it's very often is blurred. And, and we, we, we put all these people, we put in one basket and we say, we don't want any migrants. But it's, it's how to make sure that, that really they don't, take mis they don't make mistake and we distinguish perfectly well those who are coming just for economical reasons. Yes, life in their country is difficult, but they still can live in their, their, their countries. But people who, are, who will be persecuted, persecu and they will be put in jail. And the, the facts, we collected really a lot of, a lot of proof that, if, that these people, when they are abroad, they are quite closely watched by Chinese authorities. And once they will be on the plane, and we have even the proofs that some people who try because they believe that perhaps they somehow can escape, but when they, they, they got back to China, they were arrested and put in jail. We have even more uh, delicate and uh, I would say tragic case, because there is, in particular in the US now, there is one woman who was one of the biggest leaders, uh, biggest leaders in the, in the church, and uh, she was hiding for years, she was guiding in, in China. So 
From China, she escaped to, to South Korea. And from South Korea, she came to US. But the problem is that she came with the, with the, with the passport that was not hers. It was a passport because she, she destroyed all the documents that she had. So then she came with the, with the, with the false name. Now she's in jail. So, and the Chinese, because this person for them is crucial because they are, they are chasing the people who are taking, who are having the, the high positions in the church. So when they declare that this person is somebody who is uh, working for espionage, meaning that if one day she will get back to China, she will be executed. So, and now there is a long and very difficult battle is to prove that this person is exactly this person who is saying she is, and the person will not be sent back. So to conclude, so in, in general, in the US, it's, uh, it's, it's a very good country because in most of the cases, uh, specifically the, the members of the Church of Almighty God, they don't have the problems. So they, they quite easily can, if they can prove their identity, if they can prove that they belong to the, to the church, they are, they are given the, the refugee status. It's much more complicated in Europe and it's very complicated in South Korea. So, but, but as I said, it's very important that we will not forget and uh, that we will not mix the, the refugees uh, together with the migrants and, uh, and that uh, the things that will not change because some things are already, like we have a feeling that is changing even in the US, that we will not forget that to protect the, the freedom of religion is also to protect the people who are knocking on our doors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, one of the arenas is important arenas is Geneva, where the Human Rights Council of United Nations is. Each member country of United Nations every five years is subject to what is called the Universal Periodic Review, and China comes in November this year. So many NGOs have filed. Uh, uh, documents about the persecution of, uh, I know, Falun Gong and the uh, Church of Almighty God, most probably of other groups, Muslim groups as well. Another uh, part of the Human Rights Council in Geneva is the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, where you can uh, uh, submit cases of people who are in jail and you believe they shouldn't be on individual basis, and uh, you can try to have a determination that uh, their detention is arbitrary. Now, the UN will not send troops if they are not freed, but uh, uh, will ask the country to free them uh, if they don't, uh, uh, at least uh, uh, that their public image would suffer. So, of course, it's not immediately enforceable at the determination of this authority, but it's politically important. Now, Alessandro Micarelli is an attorney with Obaseki Law Firm in London, and he specializes in such cases and has recently filed a couple of cases against China, the working group for arbitrary detention in Geneva, so we will shortly hear from him about this case. Good afternoon. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you to Mr. Pompeo for having the vision of organizing this meeting. Thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, as Rosita and Massimo said, uh, democracy is a very important basic basis for the uh, implementation of freedom of religion and belief. Uh, likewise, rule of law and human rights are vital for the implementation of freedom of religion and belief. Freedom of religion and belief is in fact one, one of the um, fundamental human rights contained in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which protects with its Article 18, freedom of religion and belief for all. The People's Republic of China is not a member of the um, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights of 1966, which signed in 1998 but never ratified it. Nonetheless, China 
is bound by the content of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and as such as to respect freedom of religion and belief of all. The Chinese Constitution does recognize freedom of religion for all with its Article 36, but Article 300 of the Chinese criminal law does punish anybody belonging to a Xiao, which, as Massimo Trovenia said, means a heterodox teaching. There are some groups that are being recognized in China and can officially operate as religions, but they are controlled and kind of administered and managed by the Communist Party. All other groups don't have such freedom. Over the last few years, one uh, of the targets of the Chinese Communist Party is the uh, Church of Almighty God. The Church of Almighty God is a, a Chinese new religious movement founded in the 90s in China. Hundreds of members of Church of Almighty God are in detention only for belonging to this group. We can say that Article 300 as such is <coughs> very unjust and it's also abused by the authorities. As Massimo said, recently I filed two complaints with the working group for the working group on arbitrary detention in Geneva on behalf of two detainees belonging to the Church of Almighty God. There were no allegations, no accusations of any kind against them, apart from being members of the Church of Almighty God. In other cases, the authorities fabricate stories like the McDonald murder that Massimo mentioned just before. What is very interesting is that this procedure with the working group on arbitrary detention can be used by anyone who is uh, suffering arbitrary detention. It's a very powerful tool, but of course there are some issues because it's not easy to uh, provide evidence that the detainee who is claiming to be in a state of arbitrary detention is in fact in a state of arbitrary detention. And why it's not easy to provide this kind of evidence? Because the script is always the same. These people are gathering in a house, the police officers break into the house, search them without a warrant, arrest them, take them to police station, and start moving them from place to place. They can't have any contacts with family. We they cannot have any contacts whatsoever with the other people from their community. So they just disappear. They are kind of kidnapped by the authorities. So when the family or members of their community, their church, want to file a complaint with the working group, they have no proofs at all. They have no evidence. But <laughs> It's very important to try to collect as much information as possible. And as I did in this case, it's very important to rely on expert opinions from scholars. So I managed to get expert opinion from Massimo, from other scholars. I submitted a number of scholarly articles on the Church of Almighty God and all the cases of persecution they have suffered. So even if you don't have proofs and evidence specific to the case, it is good to provide as much information as possible and as much evidence as possible. China is not a member, I said, of the International Covenant, but it's bound by the content of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it's also bound by the content of international customary law, which means that arbitrary detention is considered something uh, accepted internationally. So uh, in this meaning, China has also um, the prohibition of, uh, of uh, torture, the prohibition of Arbitrary detention is also mentioned in the Chinese constitution. 
So China has accepted to prohibit arbitrary detention, and China has to implement what is in the Constitution. China is a great country with a very long history. Chinese people are very hardworking people. China is a country where religion and spirituality have very positively influenced the society over the last centuries. So now it's time for China to comply <coughs> with the international obligations, to start stopping labeling groups as a Xiao, which are often referred to as evil cults, which makes even harder for this group to be accepted also in the West. And I think that the cases of people applying for refugee status, people from Church of Almighty God and from other communities in China that are being labeled as Xi Zhao, and the Western literature <coughs> called them heavy cults. So when the authorities in the West peruse the application, say, you belong to a cult, so why should we grant you refugee status? <coughs> so it's now time for, for a change, for very important uh, and massive uh, lobbying activity. So as Rex said, uh, it's time to start a new international movement for religious freedom. And it's nice to see so many people like you in this room, because we all have same vision and same mission. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you to the three experts. Now we're going to move over to the representatives of the religious communities that are victims of persecution in China. Uh, I want to start with the, the Uyghur Human Rights Project, uh, co sponsoring this lunch. It's, it's Nuri. Okay. Turkey, right? Am I saying it right? Yeah. Okay, okay it's sorry. Not working. This one? Yeah. Not working. It's working, but is it? Oh, sorry, how about now? Sorry. Uh, could you ask the speakers to speak in the microphone? That's fine, yep. Um, do you, you guys, you can sit here and use these microphones or speak up here, it's up to you. But we're going to go with Nuri Turkle first, the Human Rights Project. Then we can go with Larry Liu, Dr. Larry Liu Falun Gong. And then we'll go with Zhen Qing of Church of Almighty God. And then we can have some a discussion about solutions. So first to you, Nuri. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of today's important discussion. The, um, I'm not a religious speaker. Uh, I don't have a religion uh, story related to my religion here as an individual uh, because I've been lucky enough to be in this wonderful country in the last 23 years. Uh, when I left the country, it was not this bad. So I'm telling, um, I'm sharing with you the Weaver story as a representative of the co-sponsoring organization. As you have been reading on the newspapers lately, the situation for the Weaver people in East Turkestan has been deteriorated so rapidly, uh, particularly since last April, uh, April 2017. And the people in the civilized world are gradually starting to understand uh, the Weaver's uh, dire situation, particularly the, the newspaper articles being published in the United States, lightening uh, the Uyghur situation to the internment camps, uh, the Soviet-style gloves, and uh, about 10% of the population reportedly being detained in the so-called re-education camps uh, in the Uyghur's homeland. Uh, why do the Chinese so afraid of the Uyghur uh, religion? Uh, why are they so afraid of the Uyghur's ethno-national identity? It's, it's very, quite simple. Uh, I hope I'm not making it more rational, uh, some rational approach for the Chinese, uh, on the Chinese uh, government's perspective. Uh, simply put, the Uyghur religious freedom, Uyghur religious identity, and ethno-national identity have been perceived by the Chinese government since the 90s as a stumbling block to forced assimilation and also a potential political threat. So the existence of the Uyghur identity, the daily practices of Uyghurs and peaceful religious practices have been seen as a problem. 
Uh, Chinese have uh, used uh, what's called a carrot and stick uh, in the 80s, allowed some mosques to be built and allowed some uh, religious freedom. But uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, in the 90s, and particularly uh, since 9-11, the Chinese government have opportunistically used the uh, war on terrorism as an excuse to uh, crack down on Uyghur's religious freedom. Um, let's move forward to the uh, events taking place in the last uh, year or so. The Chinese enacted uh, a draconian uh, law a regulation known as de extremification measure that was put in place last April that sanctions most common and appropriate behaviors that we, uh, people who live in a civilized society, uh, chose to do or even appreciate, such as wearing uh, traditional clothes, uh, which is seen as a sign of diversity and cultural appreciation in Western societies. Uh, growing a beard, uh, but in perspective, as you, those of you who watch uh, soccer, football, notice in the last couple of years, some of the European soccer players growing a beard. If they happen to be in the Uyghur's home in Easter, it's not that they in trouble. And adhering to uh, Islamic diet, uh, like the Jewish people, we Uyghur people follow uh, halal food, uh, Jews uh, follow uh, kosher, uh, and Uyghur people have to uh, have chosen to stay within the family when it comes to marriage. That is also being seen as a extreme uh, uh, behaviors. And also uh, Islamic names, um, names like Christian, uh, Jacob, uh, if you happen to be in the Chinese territory, would be would be uh, seen as extreme. So some old people, even the, uh, in their age. Um, in the 70s, 80s, have been forced to change names such as Mohammed uh, uh, or other names from the Quranic, uh, uh, with the Quranic uh, background. Um, who are they locking up? What are those one million people have uh, done to irritate the Chinese government? When you look at the population pool that have been locked up, you'd be surprised how innocuous, how um, uh, irrelevant those people to the so-called security concerns. We've seen 80-some uh, years old Islamic scholar, once upon a time phrased and promoted by the Chinese government, and asked to translate Quran from Arabic to Uyghur. And we have the university presidents, a director of FDA equivalent in East Turkestan, soccer player, one of the rising soccer player, eight, 19 years old guy who played for the Chinese uh, soccer team, have been detained. His crime was to travel to Spain for training with um, Leno Messi. Um, and watching the, the recent soccer uh, World Cup, watching the French team, it reminded me of the Chinese struggle to get into the world stage in the football. Yeah, they should look at the Uyghur side. There are so many talented people, and yet they're locking up one of their national rising stars in prison. And also, who else are being locked up? Anyone who has foreign ties or have been traveled to some countries, particularly Turkey. And also, they have been locking up uh, Uyghur uh, elites. Uh, this is an old story. In the Mao's China, they attacked the elites. Similar things are happening. Intellectuals, writers, musicians, philanthropists, uh, of anyone who has a social influence have been locked up. So are we hearing anything from them? Um, and how many of them have been released? The numbers are very sketchy. We only have a handful of people uh, happen to be actually numbered. Two of them happen to be Kazakh individuals, one from the United States and one from Kazakhstan, telling chilling stories including denouncing their religion, denouncing their ethnic identity, uh, forced to believe in, uh, in Chinese uh, Xi Jinping thoughts, and afraid in the motherland, and condemning so-called Uyghur separatists overseas. So they're waging the psychological warfare. The people coming up uh, go crazy, if not confused. Um, and also we've been hearing people uh, living in camps, the dead person. 
So it, is, it has been very, very chilling. And you know, we live in a society, uh, we all know, never again. And I'm surprised that uh, people in the civilized world, our government here in the United States, have not been outspoken enough. And finally, I'd like to uh, bring up, um, I, I'll be happy to discuss more specifics uh, with you. Um, uh, in the Q&A session, but recently, uh, former Secretary of State Manuel Albright said, uh, when you see something, say something. And saying something is not enough to do something. So I challenge all of you to do something for the people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lu. Uh, thank you, Greg, for organizing this uh, great event, and thank you very much for the opportunity to share our story with you. I first would like to give you a brief history uh, about the Falun Gong and the persecution, and then I'll share one family story with you. Uh, Falun Gong, also known as Falun Dafa, is a traditional spiritual practice of the Buddha school, rooted from ancient Chinese culture. It consists of gentle, meditative exercises and a moral philosophy centered on the tenets of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. It was first made public in China in 1992 and was at one time celebrated by Chinese authorities openly for its health benefits, which saved a huge amount of Medicare costs for the government and for its moral teaching. Many considered Falun Gong helped stabilize Chinese society facing more and more social disparity at the time. However, as the number of practitioners grew, some hardliners inside the Communist Party regime became alert. In early 1999, Chinese government's own estimate was over 70 million, 70 million Chinese people <clears throat> were practicing Falun Gong in China at that time. And this was reported by AP and New York Times at that time. Fearing that Falun Gong was an ideological competi uh, competition to the party on, on the account of its popularity, independence, and traditional spiritual content, then Communist Party Chief Jiang Zemin launched a persecution against Falun Gong on July 20, 1999, exactly 19 years ago this month. It wasn't a popular decision at that time, even inside the Communist Party leadership. A Washington Post article in November 1999 titled Crack in China's crackdown revealed that none of the other Politburo Standing Committee members inside the Communist Party leadership agreed with Jiang's decision. But once it became the party's policy, the full weight of the state's repressive apparatus was brought down on Falun Gong. One major aspect of the persecution is pervasive misinformation and propaganda to demonize Falun Gong, and just as the previous speaker has just addressed. According to the same Washington Post article, it was Jiang that ordered Falun Gong to be branded as an evil cult three months after the crackdown started. And some media reported that Falun Gong was banned as an evil cult. That's not true. The label was only applied retroactively three months after the crackdown started to justify a brutal persecution that was condemned internationally. The other side of the persecution is massive actual legal imprisonment of practitioners in labor camps, black jails, and prisons, and officially sanctioned torture, rape, and killing. According to the 2007 State Department Human Rights Report, quote, in March 2006, United Nations Special Robert Tom Nowak reported that Falun Gong practitioners accounted for 66% of victims of alleged torture while in government custody, since the crackdown of Falun Gong began in 1999, estimates of the number of Falun Gong adherents who died in custody due to torture, abuse, and neglect ranged from several hundred to a few thousand, end quote. According to the 2009 State Department's Human Rights Report, quote, some foreign observers estimated that Falun Gong adherents constituted at least half of the 250,000 officially recorded inmates in re-education through labor camps, end quote. And these were numbers 12 years ago, 11 years ago. <clears throat> and multiple independent investigations also estimate that 
large numbers of Falun practitioners have been killed so that their vital organs could be extracted and sold for organ transplantation, a lucrative virginal burgeoning industry in China. And two years ago, the House of Representatives passed a resolution unanim unanimously condemned organ harvesting for Falun Gong practitioners and other prisoners of conscience in China. And it was passed unanimously uh, in June 2016. And you can search for that. It's House Resolution 343. According to a comprehensive 2017 Freedom House report on religious freedom in China titled The Battle for China's Spirit, there is, quote, credible evidence suggesting that beginning in the early 2000s, Falun Gong detainees were killed for their organs on a large scale, end quote. A new groundbreaking investigative, investigative documentary released in November 2017 by TV Chongsan in South Korea shows that the forced organ harvesting is still happening in China, and foreign patients still go to China for organ transplant because of the short waiting time gap. Over the past 19 years, the persecution of Falun Gong has torn apart millions of families in China. Today, I'd like to share with you one family story. And they're from my hometown in Liaoning province. Uh, this is Li Hua Chi and, uh, and her daughter Xin Yang Xu. And uh, because their English is limited, so I'll read her statement. <clears throat> On February 4th, 2001, I'm reading as her statement. My husband, Da Wei Xu, you can see his photo, you know, and, uh, and that's his daughter, you know, holding her dad's photo. My husband, Davi Xu, and I were arrested in Shenyang City for printing materials that exposed the persecution of Falun Gong, and the police took us to the sixth office. Uh, I was locked in a torture room. Two very tall men, uh, ruthlessly beaten, beat my head and face, and one of them took off my coat and then he used his big shoes to smack my back and head. I was stunned, vomited, and my head was dizzy and ears were ringing. My husband and I were married for only eight months, and I was pregnant at that time. I later learned that the police had who captured us received 50,000 yuan, that's about 8,000 US dollars, as a reward. I was detained in Shenyang City Detention Center for a month, and then later bailed out due to my pregnancy. But my husband, Dao Xu, was sentenced to eight years in prison. During his term, he was transferred to four different prisons. When our, daughter's was, when our daughter was only one month old, I took her to prison to see. When she was four months old and was not finished running, I was, uh, I was again arrested by the police. I was tortured almost to death in nine days, and then was sent back home. During the eight years that my husband was in prison, I took my daughter and family members, traveled to those four different prisons trying to see him. But unfortunately, most of the time, we were not allowed to see him because the police said he has not renounced his belief in Falun Gong. When my husband was in Lin Yuan prison, I received a secret phone call from a prisoner there. He said that he could not bear to see how prison guards were torturing my husband. The guards instructed prisoners to use needles to prick his fingers and toes, tie him to poles, shock him with electric batons, and gag him with a rag, among other things. He also told me that Dawei, my husband, was tortured so severely that he could barely breathe. The prison hospitals diagnosed my husband with pleural effusion. I was also told that the money we sent to my husband never made it to him. After eight years of imprisonment, my husband was sent home. His body was full of scars. You can see the picture that when he was released, when he was sent home. His body was full of scars. His neck had strangled marks. Traces of electric baton shocks on his belly. You can still see the mark on his belly from those electric baton shocks. And he was skinny to the bone. And you can see his picture before he was in prison, how healthy he was. He passed away 13 days after he returned home. In those 13 days, he was sometimes sober, but sometimes confused. When he was sober, he told me that guards in Shenyang Dongling's prison injected him with some nerve-damaging poisons and gave him unknown drugs. 
Those 13 days was the only time that my daughter spent with, his father, with her father. Those 13 days were the only time that my daughter spent uh, with her father, and she was only eight years old at that time. She's 16 now. After my husband's death, I appealed to the local government many times, and hundreds of local villagers signed my petition with their real name to show their support. Because of my activism, the police tried to arrest me again. My daughter and I were forced to flee our home to avoid persecution. In early 2014, we fled to Thailand and applied for the United Nations refugee status. In 2017, we were resettled to the US. We'd like to thank the UNHCR and the US government for rescuing us and accepting us. We ask your continuous support to millions of family practitioners and other prisoners of conscience still suffering in China today. Thank you. Thank you for coming and sharing your, your heartbreaking story. All right, now we have uh, Jen Chang from the uh, Church of Almighty God. Now, she doesn't speak English, so she's going to speak in Chinese, but you have, she, you should have her remarks in English, you know, if you want to follow along on, on the paper. So, Jen Chang.大家好，我叫曾晴，今年三十八岁，一九九七年加入全能神教会。我因为信全能神，被中共警察抓捕，遭到酷刑折磨一个半月。老教两年，二零一零年获释出狱后，我仍被中共政府调查追捕，被迫
。我意识到自己的伤势很严重。下午，一个警察用高压电警棍电击我，并且对我拳打脚踢。我浑身又麻又痛，趴在地上几乎无法动弹，只闻到汗毛被烧焦的味道。警察边用力踢打我，边吼叫着说：“国家有令，信神的人打死白死。今天是我们共产党掌权，我们就要往死里整你们。”他们一直折磨我到凌晨。那时我心里只有一个信念：神若不允许我死，就是只剩一口气，我也能活下去。八月二号。两个警察给我戴上黑头套，把我拖上警车，带到深山的一座二层小楼里。我见到了与我一起被抓的姊妹，我们被关在不同的房间，警察分三边倒，二十四小时轮流看管我们。八月三日晚上，警察开始审问我，用电警棍电击我，轮流对我拳打脚踢。折磨我到大半夜。这期间，隔壁不断传来姊妹被折磨、被打得惨叫的声音。八月四日，我听说姊妹受不了酷刑，割腕自杀，差点丧命。我心里很难受，只能默默地为姊妹祷告，求神加给她力量。晚上，两个警察轮流殴打我三个小时。又用粗布条把我的手铐绑在高高的暖气管子上，我的整个身体几乎悬挂在半空中。手铐的锯齿扎进肉里，双手的血管也胀得像要迸裂开一样。我痛得浑身直冒汗。警察一会儿把布条松一下，一会儿又拉上去，手铐的锯齿一次一次次的扎进肉里。就这样来回吊了我三个小时，我的手腕被硬生生磕出两道血口子。之后，他们把我放下来，一个警察又硬把一瓶芥末油灌进我的嘴里，我呛得快要窒息了。这样的折磨，酷刑折磨一直持续到凌晨两点。八月五日。我被送往看守所，当时我浑身全是伤，走路都困难。警察还每隔每隔一两天就来提审我一次，继续毒打我，用腰带头夹我的手指，用手指抠我的锁骨，想尽办法逼我放弃信仰，背叛神，出卖教会弟兄姊妹。我每天都活在紧张恐怖的气氛里。只要号门、号房的牢门、铁房一铁门一响，我就不自觉的浑身发抖。我在看守所的一个月零二十二天，比那五天酷刑还难熬。九月中旬的一天，鸡西市公安局给我扣上扰乱社会秩序的罪名，直接判处我两年劳教，并口头通知我的家人。这时，我的家人才知道我被中共抓捕了。二零零八年九月，我被押上到押送到黑龙江省女子劳教所。警察跟犯人说我是信全能神的，常常指使犯人打骂我。我每天被迫劳动十几个小时，晚上还得值三个小时的夜班在那里，要想平安的度过每一天，真的是不容易。我只能深夜在被窝里流着泪，向全能神祷告，思念神的爱。正是从神获得的力量，才使我坚强的活了下来。二零一零年，二零一零年五月，我被释放出狱。警察要求我定期去当地派出所报道，如果发现还信全能神，抓住还要判重刑。为了能继续信神，我被迫离家逃亡。二零一六年，在神奇妙的摆布安排下，我逃到了美国
。在这里，我终于不再担心因信神被警察抓捕，可以大胆地说我是信全能神的，可以自由释放的见证全能神的。我感到很幸福，很感恩，也恳切的希望能有更多正义人士关注全能神教会基督徒受迫害的实情，帮助并保护他们。给他们一片信仰自由的天空，谢谢。Thank you very much. So, see,、uh, Ambassador Brownback when he was talking about this ministerial, and he was encouraging stories. The persecution to be told, and you can see why. I mean, they're very moving stories,、uh, and, and these are the stories that move us to act. You know, and this is why this ministerial is happening. You know, because we need to stop. You know, this this type of behavior by governments. You know, and even so, the non-state actors too, who would、uh, persecute people for their for their beliefs and for their faith. So we have about、uh, 22 minutes. Uh, so I just wanted to turn the the conversation now to what what we can do about this, because again, coming out of this ministerial, we're gonna, we're all going to be focused on actions, on actions we can all take together, coordinating together in multi faith、uh, fashion, and work civil society working with government. What what can we do about this? And I know just to set the the stage, you know, you hear people having to flee their homes with flee persecution just to, to save their own lives,、um, and. Luckily, some people are getting, you know, their their asylum applications approved and they're resettled here in the U.S. or other countries.、Uh, but others are having trouble, you know, and get rejected for asylum,、uh, and then are under threat of deportation right back to the to their home country, where they could be imprisoned again and tortured, and even maybe lead lead to their death. So, a couple things, you know, we we wanted to focus on what we can do. While we're trying to stop this kind of persecution, you know, what can we do to make it easier? You know, where there's a higher、uh, percentage of approval of asylum applications or other legal status, right, for people who are fleeing persecution in this way. But also, I want to bring up Terry Marsh too. He was a human rights attorney. She's been involved in several lawsuits against the Chinese government, and she's recently won a, a couple of victories in U.S. federal court. Because part of it too is when people are applying for, for for asylum, you know the immigra- immigration judges, you know, there, there might be、uh, differing interpretations, or the immigration judges might not accept, you know, somebody is、uh, as as a, a, a true、uh, religious believer who's being persecuted. And so I think that some of the, the court victories that, that Terry has, has has won, you know, might help to establish like criteria that could be. Apply, you know, for certain religious communities. So judges are accepting that they really are under, they're facing religious persecution, and, and not, you know, because some judges are finding some of these stories not credible, and they're denying, you know, applications for asylum because they don't quite understand, like why these persecuted communities and members of these communities do what they do to survive. But an immigration judge here in the U.S. may not understand it and may deny applications as a result. But Terry, can you just give us a, a quick summary on, on, on your legal victory, and then we can have a, a few minutes of, of discussion here on what you guys think that we all can do to get governments here in the U.S. and other Western countries, South Korea,、uh, applying、uh, standards equally and, and universally. And then what can we do to increase pressure on the Chinese? But go ahead, Terry. Terry, you want to speak to the podium? She's going to speak there. Do you want me? She's got a mic. Terry Marsh from Human Rights Law Foundation. I'm a little. Yeah. Is this? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Thanks. So there's a handout that some of you have. I think most of you have, and and I created the handout so that if you decide that、um, any of this information is useful, you have all the cases listed in the handout,、um, and you don't have to. You know, rely on your memory、um, from what I'm saying. So, I've been litigating um, cases um, on behalf of Falun Gong, especially, but also Tibetan Buddhists, and I've worked to some extent with Uyghurs for quite a while.、Um, 
so this is just kind of a snapshot of what I've been doing in the hope that it will be helpful to you. Um, I do have other ideas that are not part of this presentation. For example, suing the Chinese government together because you're talking about something unified. And I have at least one idea about, you know, just every, every single group together, just sue the government of China. Um, but that's not this talk. So let me just begin. Um, and this, this, will help, this will help, obviously, asylum seekers. But it will also help in a lot of other ways. I mean, if you're, if you're sending a report to the United Nations um, Committee Against Torture or the UNUPR or something else, I mean, if you can designate yourself as a religion under US law, that's highly persuasive. Um, let me just also say that the, the religious definition test that I'm going to be sharing with you is based on every single circuit. I read every single case for every single circuit. It took me a couple of months. I didn't skip at all. So the, the definition is quite comprehensive. Um, and if you're in a specific circuit seeking asylum, um, for example, you might be in the Ninth Circuit or you might be in the Second Circuit, then you want to look at the different test that is on the handout. So very broadly, I would just begin by saying that the Supreme Court, in a case called U.S. v. Ballard, Ballard rejected a definition of religion based on the content of the views espoused. And that took me a second to say, but that's really the crux of what's going on here, that you can't say that this is a religion because it's familiar to us and there's you know, Yahweh or some other God that we recognize. Um, and this is not because it's not familiar and maybe there's no God. Maybe there's a spiritual force that's transcendent, that moves us to act. So that, that opinion really animates, that's the Supreme Court, that animates the, the circuit court cases. Um, I don't know how much time I have. So. A couple more minutes. OK. Mm -hmm. So I'll just, I'll just share then one circuit court case with you, and then I'll just tell you about a statute that could be helpful um, in litigation. So the Second Circuit, which is where my case is, um, so I'm very familiar with that. The Second Circuit Court of Appeals case um, is based on a book called The Nature of the Religious Experience by William James. Um, it's a very deep definition. It's very profound. It's very useful. And basically, this is what it boils down to. Is the belief, one, sincerely held? Do you really believe this? OK. Two. Does it occupy a place in your life that's parallel to an orthodox belief in God? And that's actually very, very broad. Because, for example, with Falun Gong, Falun Gong believes that cultivation may lead to salvation. OK, well, that's parallel to a belief in God that can enable you to reach heaven. It's parallel. And so, and if I get this wrong about Scientology, tell me. But it seems to me that the practice of Scientology serves as a path to a form of enlightenment, which is parallel to, I, I don't know if I'm using the words right, which is parallel to a belief in God. So under the Second Circuit test, Scientology is also religion. The, 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 the other people speaking today, I mean, obviously practice religions. Um, if there is a God, then, then obviously it's, it's, much, it's a much easier test to, to pass. There are, by the way, um, some, some cases that actually say the Church of Scientology is a religion. Um, and I have those on the handout. Um, so, so if you or people you know are seeking asylum, you know this is very useful because it really goes by circuit. Um, and I'm happy to give more information if anybody needs it. The only other point I was going to make is that there's a lot of statutes um, that protect religious, the exercise of one's religion in this country. Um, and this may speak to a little bit wider audience. Um, there have been a lot of church burnings. There have been a lot of attacks on sheiks. There's attacks on Muslims. There's attacks on Falun Gong. I don't know if there's a tax on Uyghurs in this country. I hope not. Um, but there's a statute. It's USC 18248A2. And it says that if you are worshiping, which is a very broad term, it means are you in some sort of communion with the deity or the divine, 
If you are doing that near the place where you actually do worship, whatever it is, it could be the desert, it could be the mountains, it could be a temple. If you are doing that and if anybody either intimidates you or attacks you, you can file a civil rights case under this statute and you can get damages, and which is good because then that creates a precedent so that people will, will stop. You know, we'll stop doing that to you. So I just wanted to conclude by saying that the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act is the statute that allows one, that it, it basically says one cannot sue a government. However, there's an exception under that, which I think would be an umbrella for as many groups as might want to sue the government of China. Thank you. Thank you very much. So maybe I'll just, if I ask one question, Maybe these are the experts and community reps here can give an answer. And then if there's a couple of questions from the floor, we can do that before we wrap up. But what can I get one recommendation from each expert on as far as like what should we do about it? like what's the most effective thing that you think we could do as NGOs and, and what governments can do to try to, to solve this, this problem? Well, in one minute, I just want to share a good practice uh, from Italy. You have been given a brochure on Church of Almighty God. That's not a publication of the Church of Almighty God. That's a translation of a report, uh, Cesdor and Orly, our organization, were commissioned uh, to do by the Italian Ministry of Internal Affairs because Italy is one of the three countries with most uh, refugee applications in the world of members of Church of Almighty God. And uh, the decisions were initially very negative, as Rosita said, and were largely based on news picked up on the internet, where unfortunately the Chinese propaganda is very active. So a lot of fake news. And also there are problems of translation. Refugees sometimes uh, uh, speaking Chinese, uh, translators of the refugee commissions not very well paid, so it's difficult to communicate. So we were commissioned to do a brochure in Italy and explain what the Church of Almighty God, uh, which was prepared by religious scholars. And the uh, brochure is very useful. The last Italian decisions are almost all favorable. And so we decided to prepare uh, uh, English translation. You see it for the first time today. And I believe this sort of instruments can be done for other groups too. And are very useful to tell commissions, diplomat, politicians, immigration authorities what these religious groups are about and to counter the fake news of the totalitarian government propaganda. So feel free when we have these brochures to take one. Thank you, Massimo. Brazil. You should understand that this, uh, to have a diversity like China is, is very difficult because, first of all, the, the, of this uh, huge, massive uh, economic opportunities. And, uh, and very often, the states they go into dealing with China. Because when China comes for official visit in a certain country, the, the, one of the conditions is if you, if, you will, if you will try to talk about the human rights, we are not coming. If you will try to criticize about the human rights, we cancel the business agreements. So, and we understand that the money on one hand and principles on the other hand, and it's very often that the money takes over. So my point is that it's very difficult to teach China. And China is totally allergic to talk about the human rights, let's say, or the, or the stories that you hear, because it's something they don't like. They want to project the image of China, superpower, uh, everything is just fine. So and perhaps it's really like advice how we should approach this I don't even have the, the answers, it's very difficult. But uh, the role of the, of the civil society is, is to spread the message, is to talk about it. It's not to let to be forgotten that 
is, is, is business is perhaps is one thing, but, but still the, 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 the norms that we all we are very much attached is still there. So, and, uh, and not to be fooled by the propaganda and the fake news that we receive every day, and uh, the, the demonizing the groups and, uh, and, and people uh, that simply the authorities they don't like. It, it goes with China, it goes with Russia, it goes with, with many other countries, because you see that this, this, this fight to project the nice image and reality, what is happening on the ground in totally different forms. So, and uh, I would call that for, that's, that's what I do, and I call the others also not to be fooled, but really, like, be very careful and sensitive, and not really forget what is really happening. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, what I want to say is, uh, as just Massimo said earlier today, uh, we must be united, we, we must work all together. In my experience, uh, I'm currently chairing the European Federation for Freedom of Media. Uh, it's a European Federation mainly focused on problems regarding freedom of religion and belief in Europe. When we talk about problems about freedom of religion and belief, we are not just talking about China or Russia. There are problems everywhere, also in Europe, in Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and in Western Europe as well. So, uh, we realize that many of us were meeting at events since maybe 15 and more years, then we said we should do something all together. We all have different groups, different associations, we said let's try merging our associations, putting all the efforts together towards the same direction. That's why we created the European Federation of Freedom of Belief. Of course, every association, they will be keeping their own identity carry out their own activities. And what is important to do? Working together, loving and loving and loving members of the parliament, members of the national authorities. There are many people of goodwill in the governments, in the parliaments, and in many cases they know nothing about the problems experienced by people belonging to religious minorities. When you talk to them uh, about problems experienced by the Church of Scientology or other organizations, some of them are kind of shocked because they cannot imagine these kind of problems exist in Europe. So it's very important to, every time there is a chance to organize an event, to do something together, we have to do that something together. Anyway, there are many opportunities like in the, in the OSCE in Warsaw. Every year there is a human Dimension implementation meeting where NGOs can participate, make statements, submit statements and communications to the governments. So that's the recipe we have to work all together, regardless of our backgrounds, all together towards the same direction. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. How about any recommendations over here from yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Liu? <coughs> Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, make a recommendation. Um, I have a rather different approach uh, when it comes to China on the uh, Uyghur Islam issue. Um, I, I'd like to um, get our president, uh, our government, to um, uh, a group up with like-minded governments, or maybe the governments that have um, a little bit more practical influence over China. Um, we all know that President Trump enjoys very close relationship with uh, Saudi King Solomon. And Solomon, uh, King Solomon almost have uh, the, uh, the type of influence that might, one might imagine when it comes to uh, Muslim people's religious freedom in China. If, if the United States government at least convince its Muslim allies to speak in one voice, even though those Muslim country, countries are not really a beacon of democracy and human rights. But when it comes to China, there's a potential opportunity for President Trump to use its influence, uh, particularly on the, uh, to start, they can focus on one issue, uh, removing the, uh, the quota on Hajj uh, pilgrimage uh, that 
that Saudi Arabia, for example, could do. And also, uh, like the Cold War period, the United States should team up with like-minded governments. Uh, I commend uh, Secretary Pompeo doing exactly that uh, this week. Uh, should be, uh, there should be a follow-up, uh, specific on concrete, coherent steps. Uh, having this meeting this week in Washington is important, but what will be done afterwards is, is more important. So I call on uh, Secretary Pompeo to use this opportunity to uh, use whole government, like-minded uh, people approach. And finally, the um, United States has a very important tool at its possession, uh, disposal, uh, Global Magnitsky Act. Um, a senior official, Ms. Stone and uh, Ambassador Brumbach, recently said in public that United States government is willing to use Global Magnitsky Act to uh, punish those human rights uh, abusers in China. Uh, they, will, they will understand Global Magnitsky Act very well, like the way that Putin's henchmen understood and, and um, upset with the original Magnitsky Act. So that's one way to deter the ongoing human rights abuses. And then finally, United States Congress, uh, we're sitting in this uh, building, it's, it cannot think of any more appropriate place to say this. Um, I am disappointed as many, uh, as my fellow Uyghur Americans have, that the United States Congress, even though it's been almost two years since this uh, mass incarceration has uh, taken place, have not even issued a resolution, uh, a single resolution. If it's not uh, a concurrent resolution, is a possibility. We have already uh, a very powerful uh, statement being uh, statements being made by Senator Marco Rubio and others. Um, it is it is it is urgent, and, and it's time to do at least a resolution, if not a. Uh, uh, a binding uh, a legislation to give mandate uh, to the administration to do more specific steps. Thank you. Dr. Liu? Yeah, I just uh, would like to provide an additional point. I think, uh, you know, uh, other than all the initiative on the government side, I think raising public awareness of religious persecution in China uh, will be uh, very helpful because uh, if Americans care, their governments care, right? I mean, so. Uh, I would just want to want to point out two aspects that uh, actually connect uh, the religious persecution in China with Americans' daily life. Actually, uh, many people think, well, that's on the other side of the planet. You know, uh, I have nothing to do to do with that. But actually, it's not true. And uh, five years ago, uh, both New York Times and CNN front page had a story about an Oregon woman bought a ha Halloween tombstone kit from Kmart, and she found a letter inside. The letter was written by a Falun Gong practitioner uh, working as a slave laborer, making the product in Masanyan labor camp. And that made international headlines. And uh, so uh, that story just made me think, how many other products Americans buy from Walmart, Target, you know, other department stores, were actually made by prisoners of conscience, particularly for their belief in China. And all of these uh, free slave labor also contributes to the job losses in America, right? We're talking about trade right now with China. So these really, these are real life instant connect the persecution in China with American's daily life. And actually tomorrow there will be a screening of a film called Letter from Masenja about this real life story. And tomorrow at the Foreign Service Association, you know, there's a uh, flyer outside on the table. And also the other aspect is about this organ harvesting. And China has become uh, you know, international organ tourism hub. And because of short waiting time, people around the world, they couldn't wait in their own country, <laughs> and they go to China and to find an organ within a few weeks and within a few days. And uh, these including Americans, Europeans, Middle Eastern, Japanese, Koreans, you know, all over the world. And uh, so, <clears throat> so that's not just a China issue anymore. We're all part of it, you know, and those people, I'm not really blaming the patients, they're desperate, but on the other hand, that's a conflict, right, about that crime. And uh, if you don't really have a demand, there wouldn't be supply. And, uh, but I, I, at the same time, there are a lot of collaboration between the American medical community with Chinese medical community. Many Chinese doctors were trained in the US 
and they go back to China and they commit this crime. And there are pharmaceutical companies here and or from Europe, they go to China and doing clinical trials on these immunosuppression drugs used in transplantation because it's so, so quick to get an organ and so easy to do a clinical trial. So that all made our medical community, our patients to be part of this. And uh, so I think there is a, both a moral application, but also in real life you know, connection that uh, we should raise more awareness. And when Americans are more you know, care about this issue, and also I think it will be easier for Congress and the government to act. Thank you. All right, we're out of time. But it's, I wanted to thank you all again for, for attending, again, this opening side event for Ministerial Week. And uh, if you haven't seen it, we have the International Religious Freedom Roundtable. We've pu published a, it's online. So it's, a, it's like an e-program of all the diff all the formal meetings at State Department, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but then all of the, of the side events, Monday through Friday. You know, this was the kickoff, but there's five, five days worth of side events. And they're very good, like very deep and substantive program. And it's very impressive. And it shows the amount of attention uh, and interest uh, around this topic and, and the need for this ministerial and the need to, to coming out of this ministerial to build that global religious freedom network so we can you know start having these follow-up meetings and there will be follow-up meetings coming out of the ministerial including the round table we will start having our own uh, follow-up meetings starting in August or September to start talking about what we're going to do about this what actions are we going to take you know, and, and how can we reach out and coordinate with governments and parliamentarians all around the world so that we can start reversing this trend and start scoring victories you know, for religious freedom for all. So thank you again for, for attending and hope to see you at other events this week. Thank you.